still rocking after all these years. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. This is it, the show that started it all. Often imitated, but never equal. From San Francisco, USA, uh, online since 2004, right. is the one and only yeah. Rock and Roll Geek Show. With the original Rock and Roll Geek, Michael Butler. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name is Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020, and it's 7.09 p.m. when I'm recording this intro. I just got off the phone with a guy named Kurt Davis. He used to be in a band called Bullet La Volta, and he under, he, his stage name was Yucky Gipe. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Bullet La Volta, but they were a Boston band came out around well they were on tang records which which had a shitload of boston hardcore bands like uh gangrene the fus uh straw dogs just a whole bunch of bands and bullet la volta was around that same time and i have two of their albums the gift and swan dive both of those albums are absolutely amazing punk rock slash hard rock albums. And I was coming back from mu hunting mushrooms uh, last week with my wife up in the mountains in Trinity County. And on the way back, we were listening to Swan Dive. And I, I told Yucky, I told Kit Kurt, I'll call it Kurt. I told him this story and, but I put it on and man, that album held up so well I don't know if you've heard this band before, but uh, they are a great, they were, they're not together anymore, but those two albums are two of my favorite albums of all time. So I decided I was going to try to track down the singer from Bullet La Volta, and it was not easy, but I managed to track him down and he agreed to come on. I had to do, do some convincing, but he, he finally agreed to come on and you've never heard of this guy, but hopefully you will be a fan after this interview, the interview goes almost an hour, and uh, yeah, I'm going to play a Bullet La Volta song from The Gift, and then we're going to go into the interview. Hope you enjoy it, friends. Kurt Davis, a.k.a. Yucky Gipe from Bullet La Volta. I'm going to play a song from The Gift. This song is called, um, I'll play Over the Shoulder, and then we'll go into the Kurt Davis interview. Thank you for listening, friends. You know where to find me, rockandrollgeek.com, rockandrollgeek at gmail.com. I will come back and say some parting words and play a tune after this interview. Here is Over the Shoulder. <laughs>
Hey, Kurt, how's it going? Good, thanks. Thanks a lot for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's no problem, man. I will try to make it as painless as possible. I'm a little bit uh, introverted, and sometimes I'll ask stupid questions, so I apologize if I ask anything really stupid. <laughs> don't, don't apologize. I, you know, likewise, I'm sure that I, I'll have plenty of things to apologize for as well. So there you go. So you go by Kurt Davis. Is that what your name is? Yeah, that's my name. I mean, yeah, I went by Yucky Guy for years. It was sort of that was my punk rock name. Yeah, How... that I that I that I uh, came up with all my friends uh, during the Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten years. You know. So, what does Yucky Guy mean? Uh, it doesn't mean anything. You know, it was sort of like I guess you know just sounded good okay. to me at the time. Uh -huh. and, you know. I, we, we, me and my friends, when we were kicking around and trying to like sort of come up with like alter egos, we all sort of came up with names for each other. And mine was Yucky Guy. My friend was, I had a friend named Johnny Quest and uh -huh. another, one, another one named Lumpy. And, you know, I don't know. We just all had names. So, <laughs> did you, did you grow up? Did you grow up in, you didn't, I, I saw an interview. I could, it, it was, first of all, uh, you are extremely difficult to track down. I want you to know that. Well, I'm not, I don't have any Facebook presence, you know, so uh, I suppose that that makes everything more difficult. But I was listening. I just decided I was up mushroom hunting up in the mountains, for some, and some. And while I was up mushroom hunting, I said, "You know, I'd really like to hear Swan Dive again." And I said, "Man, I haven't listened to that album in quite a while." And I put it on, and my wife was in the car. <laughs> That is one of her favorite albums of all time. And uh, we were both. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and when I was listening to it, I said, man, one, what, I got to get in touch with that singer because this vocals on this album are so fucking great. And she started talking about all the lyrics, how they were so great. And, and so I started looking for, I said, how am I going to find this guy? And I started Googling Yucky Guy and nothing came up. And uh, eventually I called a singer, my old singer who lived, who used to live in Boston. And he, a friend of his name, uh, Al, got me, f found out how to get in contact with you. Do you know a guy named Al? Al Quint? Oh, yeah, Al. Yeah, oh, I know Al. Right, yeah. So if you don't. my voice, yeah. If you oh so, okay so if you if this interview ends up sucking uh, you can blame him for uh, getting me in touch. With him. <laughs> now, so. You know I don't have any sort of uh, I, I don't have any expectations so there's no baseline so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and we were listening to that album on the way back from the mushroom hunting and uh, it was like a ten mile hike and then we started listening. Every single song on this swan type on this swan dive album are fantastic. I love the the gift too. But Swan Dive, to me, like I told you when I emailed you, it's a, to me it's a masterpiece, and my wife thinks so too. Did girls like Bullet La Volta? I don't know. I mean, my, my wife loved it. You know, she, uh -huh. she, liked the, she liked the band, she liked the music. But, you know, at the time that it was happening, there was a lot of energy going on around, around you know, the around Boston that scene. scene and yeah. Everything. yeah, yeah. So... You know, there was a, there was a lot of stuff happening, and so it was a really exciting time. And you know, of course, like you know, we were kind of right in the middle of it. And Lavolta took off in a way that that you know, it's kind of like I don't know, it's weird. I didn't know any of those guys when I joined the band. I I I answered a flyer, uh -huh. and um, so it's sort of like you you know. And I was new in town. I was new to Boston. I moved there in '86, and I answered the flyer at Remember what the flyer said? Uh, you know, it said looking for a punk rock vocalist and it listed some of the influences and the influences were, they were a bunch of radio DJs on a local radio, Harvard radio station, uh -huh. WHRB. And uh, so they listed things like Motorhead and ACDC and one of the things they mentioned was the Zero Boys. And I had done the album from, cover from from, Indiana, from Indianapolis. Yeah. yeah, and I'm from Indiana. My oh, wife are. and I are both from Indi oh, okay. from Indiana. So when I saw the Zero Boys on there, and then it said something about Raw Power, and I asked them, I said, "Do you mean Raw Power the album or Raw Power the Italian hardcore band?" Yeah, they were like, "Oh, this guy's cool, man." So <laughs> so you they, knew. You so, had a little yeah, bit of knowledge. So, 
Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I just answered a flyer. And I had been a drummer before that in an Indiana hardcore band called The Repellents. Uh-huh. And uh, I had never sang before, but I had been writing words and lyrics and stuff like that. So I had like a notebook full of things. And so I decided to try out to be a singer and I had no, no experience or anything. I just called them up and um, our influence was sort of meshed. And uh, I went and they already had, I guess when they auditioned me, they already had about 10 or 11 songs, you know, written. And so I already had a bunch of lyrics. So I sort of took those lyrics and, fit them to the songs that those guys already had. And um, I guess, you know, I guess they liked it. So it worked out okay. And and things, anyway, I just, I didn't know them. They didn't know me. I just sort of strapped myself in and then we just took a ride together. You know, it was weird. I just shot out and things happened pretty quickly and the band took off pretty quickly and started getting big around Boston. So you, when you audition, you sang like, like you sang on the gift and swan dive, just the total anger and. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. And you know, probably like more like the first EP I would say was a very good indication of what it sounded like. Um, you know, the first EP that's got like baggage and dead wrong and those kind of songs. Yeah. on it. Um, when did uh, when did so when that first EP was that that was not on Tang Records was it was it the first EP was that on Tang Records? Yeah, that uh, was on Tang, and so and was it, the gift came out on Tang. Yeah, and on Tang there was there was uh, Gangrene was the big band and was kind of like the big punk rock band in New York, I'm guessing. Gangrene, Stranglehold, uh, Fu's uh, in Boston. Yeah, yeah not in New Bo- York. Right, what yeah. Did I, well, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm in Boston. Sorry. Gangrene, FUs, uh, Tang was like the only punk rock label up there, weren't they? Um, I remember this yeah, album. It's, it was a pre- remember that yeah, album. It was a pre- Sorry, you remember that album? This is Boston, not L.A. Yeah, that kind of started the entire. Uh, that, that was on Exclaim. Uh, I think that was like, I think that might have been SSD's label. I don't know who actually put that yeah, out. Yeah. But it was like an exclaim records and that was you know, I wasn't I wasn't in Boston for the Boston hardcore scene. So when, when La Volta was coming up it was like a little bit after that scene. And uh we, we came up about the same time as the women heads were starting out. Yeah. They were younger than we were, but same time. When when uh so, because Bullet La Volta is a little bit different than all those hardcore bands that were on Tang Records. I guess the Lemonheads were too. I'm not, I'm not an authority. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we were definitely different. What did did that scene there embrace you guys at, from the start? <laughs> well, I think you know, I think so. Sort of. I mean, I think it was in the transitional period. I mean, I don't know if you how much you know about the history of the Boston hardcore scene. To me, it's only become apparent like o- over time because I wasn't here at that time. But w- what happened, and, and I think that the, the Boston hardcore scene was sort of a microcosm for what happened around the country, where a lot of the bands that started out were pretty primitive and, mm. you know, thrashy and hardcore. And then they sort of started evolving a little bit more to some, more of like a metal sound. And yeah. I know that happened with that's a SSD, you know, in particular. Uh, went in a more metal direction. And I think that was in the FUs and uh, went into, you know, Straw Dogs, which is a more metal kind of direction. Right, yeah. And I think that was sort of happening around the country. I think a lot of the bands that started out as hardcore bands started getting more metal you know, in that way. Yeah. When, when La Volta was happening, um, we were sort of post that, that metal experience, you know, that changeover, but, but the guys that, that I formed the band that, that formed the band before I joined, um, we sort of took those hard rock influences, but we didn't. Honestly, you know, everybody in in La Volta was from different areas of the country. None of them were from Boston, so you know, really, I think we tapped into the same energy in a way, but weren't really a part of it, you know. So were we embraced? I think we were because I think people, I think we were sort of a natural, uh, yeah, progression because from, it was starting from, to cross over into metal. At the, yeah. Yeah. I think we were sort of a natural yeah. 
progression from the way things were going in a way, but, but not necessarily, we weren't trying to predict anything or, you know, it wasn't anticipated. It was just what, what we did at the time. And honestly, when I joined the band, I felt like they were a little more heavy. I was more of a punk rock kid. You Mm -hmm. know, I was from, I came, I came more from a hard rock background. I thought they were a little more metallic than I was sort of into, but whatever. It was like, you know, Hey, this, this seems like a good thing to do at the time. (laughs) Yeah. Where Yeah. Where in Indiana? Where in Indiana did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in a place called Anderson, which okay. is about thirty miles thirty miles north of Indianapolis. Right. I lived in Broad Ripple for a short period of time, for about a year. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's you know, I, I spent a lot of time, a lot of my formative time there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Where, when were you there? Uh, this was about maybe uh, maybe eighty six, eighty seven, something like that. Maybe eighty five, mid eighties. Right yeah. around the time I left. <laughs> yeah, there was a guy named Bill Levin who was our manager. Yeah, Bill Levin. <laughs> ran, I used to live at his house. Oh, so did we. <laughs> he was our manager. He ran this club called Muggins. <clears throat> yeah. And he employed uh, our, yeah. our entire band. And I was a cook at Muggins, and we didn't have any money or anything, so the band would come to the back door, and I would cook, you know, make everybody everything that was in the refrigerator. and. <clears throat> And he would let us play at Muggins all the time. Bill Levin, I think that guy's. No st- shit. So I think he's still around too. Yeah. Oh yeah, he is. He's like a, he's a big marijuana advocate now. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. He's a normal. He, yeah, guy. he's a, he's an impresario, man. Bill Levin. Uh, yeah, I, I lived with Bill Levin for a little while uh, huh. in in Broad Ripple. Yeah, that's with Johnny a, Quest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he Bill Levin managed the, the the Zero Boys for a while, and then he had a, a a shop called Carfax Market. That's right. Yep. Yep. And uh, my friend Johnny Quest uh, ran ran Carfax Market with Bill and worked there and recorded, you know, and he, Johnny was in a band with uh, Paul, Paul from the Zero Boys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul, called, Ma- uh, Paul Mahern, is that his name? Yeah, Paul Mahern, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we exactly. strolled into town on uh no had no money and an empty tank of gas, and we knew Tufty from... Um, from zero boys and he brought us to <laughs> this is not about the vault of it just anyway he brought us to a grocery store and bought a bunch of taco meat and stuff and he introduced us to bill levin and bill levin was doing a show at one of those clubs in broad ripple but there were so many shows going on at broad ripple and he put and we played the show and then immediately after the show he wanted to manage us and next thing we know we were living at bill levin's house for the next year <laughs> <laughs> it was good times. so you and i you you and i might have lived in the same house who probably knows? <laughs> probably so we broke we destroyed his bathroom our we had a fat drummer who decided to put uh, naked pictures all over the bathroom wall and he decided to, to use the sink as a ladder and busted the sink off the wall and we just i think we ruined bill levin's life <laughs> i think that he probably doesn't even remember that because he's probably had so many incidences <laughs> probably so probably so so when did you move to boston you go to boston did you move to boston to go to college or something no no not at all <laughs> you were chasing um, the punk I, rock I, yeah kind of yeah cause that's kind of what it was my wife and i now was my girlfriend then uh, when she, we, we lived together, <clears throat> we lived together and when she graduated from college, she didn't want to get a job there. Oh, she was going to college. Stuck, she was going to college in Boston. She was going to, no, she was going to college in, in Indiana. Oh, okay, okay. And we met, we met there and we lived together for the last year that she was in college. And then when she graduated, she didn't want to get a job in Indiana cause we'd be stuck there. And, uh, you know, yeah. I wasn't playing in a band at that point. Um, so we just kind of decided where to go. So we, we moved together with everything we owned, uh, went to Boston. Just, we chose Boston cause, um, there were, it was a good scene, nation- good music scene. Yeah. But it also had the nation's lowest unemployment rate. Oh, so okay. we, knew we, we knew we could get jobs. So mm-hmm. we, we packed up everything we had into a U-Haul and drove to Boston. We didn't know anybody. What job did you get? <clears throat> I started working in a copy center in Harvard Square, uh-huh. and Which two one? doors down from me was a record store, and the record store was where I saw the flyer for those guys looking for a singer. And working in a copy center is a good uh, job for a musician because you can print up flyers. Yeah, but I wasn't even a musician at that point. I was just a fucking schlub, you know? 
So after you joined was, Bullet La Volta, did you still work, continue to work in the coffee shop, or excuse me, in the copy center? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we worked in the coffee place for, I worked in the coffee place for a long time. In fact, the guy that gave me my job at the copy place uh, let La Volta practice in his basement uh, for free for a couple of years. And it was very, uh, you know, it was really important to our development that we had a place to practice and there were no other bands around or anything like that. We just, and he didn't charge us rent or anything. He's great. Really nice guy. So the band had member changes. Kenny Chambers came into the band. When did he come in? Well, the band originally formed with, like I said, a bunch of Harvard DJs. And one of those Harvard DJs name was Corey Lou Brennan. And he was the original lead guitar player. And But he had a very strict academic path. Was he trying to be a lawyer following. or something? No, no, no. He he became a teacher. He's, okay. He is a, uh, he's a professor. Harvard, he is Harvard now. professor. No, no. He went to Harvard, but he became a professor. Uh, he taught at Bryn Mawr, and then I'm not sure where else he went hmm. after that. But anyway, he was, he was, they were all Harvard students at the time, and he was one of the punk rock DJs hmm. there at the, at the college radio station. Um, so, when, so that when they formed, then Corey was there, but he was on a pretty strict, strict academic path. Uh, and the band started sort of taking off and, and he had other things he needed to do. And, uh, Ken Chambers was coming to some of the early Revolta gigs and the, the moving targets, his band had broken up. So when that slot came open, he wanted to try out. And, um, I actually don't think we auditioned anybody else because he knew all the songs. So, uh, we already recorded some stuff. So <clears throat> when he came into when he came in to try out, he already knew our set pretty much. And uh, so that, he, he nailed it. And so we took him on. That guy, with his, that guy is a ripping guitar player. Yeah, he's awesome. And he's a great song too. Yeah. I think that it's one of those kind of like, you hear about this a lot, right? You know, where there's, there's, there's like a, too many strong personalities in certain bands, you know, right. and it wasn't his, I think that him joining the band was sort of, you know, he wasn't the main songwriter in the band. So him being the side guitar player was good for him for a while. And eventually I think that he just got restless because he wasn't, it wasn't his band, you know, and, uh, and being a side, you know, side guy right. didn't, didn't appeal to him. He still wanted to, continue to write songs and play songs and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, things, things got disrupted a little bit. So he decided to leave. And, um, did he, was after, he, uh, he, he was on Swan Dive though, wasn't he? No. Oh, he was not on Swan Dive. Oh, no, that's Duke Roth. Duke Roth played guitar, uh, on Swan Dive. Duke was great. He was another guy that was like a, a local Boston dude. He played in a band called King Moon Racer that was, really fucking awesome yeah and Duke was a Duke was a really strong songwriter and a really strong singer actually Duke is an excellent singer and a really strong songwriter and, and a fucking amazing guitar player and I mean the, the guy was fucking unbelievable guitar player the guitar parts on Swan Dive they're like up there with Joe Perry they're they are like so tasteful these solos did he do all the solos on that album no, they, he and Clay traded off. Clay's a, an, also an excellent guitar player. He played in Chavez for years. I don't know if you yeah, know no, that band. Chavez. Which one did the most melodic solos? Because you had some of the one of the guys was doing a little bit more shredding, and the other guy was doing more uh, the melodic Joe Perry style solos. Uh, you know, I, I don't really know what you mean by that. So I'd, I'd have to like sit there with yeah. you with the record and say, "This is him, and this is him." You okay, know, yeah, and sort yeah. of break it down. <laughs> I'm going to be um, doing. Both, I'm going to be doing an episode on. I might include this in that episode, but I probably will will separate them. But I'm going to do an episode, and I'm going to break down every track, and I'm going to geek out on that album. Try to turn people onto that album because most of the people I know <clears throat> have never even heard of Bull La Volta because I'm out here in California yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, we played. We we did tour a lot, and we played a lot. And we 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 were one of those sort of also ran bands, you know that that. 
were one of the thousands of bands that were around and uh I saw you guys at the place at this place called the Covered Wagon <clears throat> Saloon in San Francisco, California. It was, yeah, I remember uh, that place. We lived upstairs from this. This was the same band that was managed by Bill Levin. We moved to Cal to San Francisco, and we lived up. There was like this flop house hotel above the Covered Wagon, and we lived up there. And they had shows at the Covered Wagon every single night of the week. And we would go, you know, we got in free because we lived at the Covered Wagon. So we and I remember seeing you guys. I think you had just. The record had just come out on on a major label, and I remember you telling everybody. I don't remember how if the crowd loved it or not. I I I loved it because I was already a Bolt Volta fan, and I remember you telling the crowd. You know, I know this is on a major label. You're almost being apologetic that it was on a major label and said, "Just steal it. We don't care how you get it. Just you know." And uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, that would that's that sounds about right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was weird, right? You know, being on a major label is, is a weird thing, you know. So were major labels, like, uh, just signing bands like crazy in Boston at that time? Is that how you got on a major, or were you just so huge? How did that happen? <clears throat> well, it was, it felt very organic, you know. We were, we, we, when we started, we started out, and we put out some radio tapes, and those got a lot of airplay locally, and then, we started playing shows and the show started getting bigger. We started getting more popular. We started, you know, it just felt organic. We just started getting bigger and we started, we'd play in New York and things were, were well there. And of course that was like at the height when like CMJ festival and all that shit was going right, down. Yeah. And you know, there, there were a lot of like conferences and conventions yeah, and yeah. shit. And before South by Southwest. Right. Yes. It was so, uh, yeah. you know, there was a, there were a lot of, a lot of bands coming up and about at that point and we were just one of the thousands of them and you know it just felt organic we were just one of one of those bands that we went to europe with the lemon heads and developed our following there we we were road tested we were pretty you know we were hungry we were fucking we were trying to fucking kill it you know we were trying to take over the fucking world or whatever and trying to fucking destroy everybody in our path or whatever. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and uh, just tr trying to be as ambitious as possible with what, you know, like I said, you sort of, you just sort of like hitch a ride and see where it goes. Right. What? So it just felt like that, that. So people were sort of sniffing around labels were sniffing around for, for bands at that time. And we were, uh, we were one of the bands and RCA was one of the labels and whatever, you know, I'm always curious when the re when the major label meets the um, you know the up and coming punk rock or indie band or whatever that was always on a smaller label. How's that? Do you remember the major label meeting? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it was really interesting. You know, at the time was so. I mean, it's all it's all this weird comedy of errors in a way <laughs> yeah. because the guy that saw us and was really enamored with us and signed us eventually was an A&R guy named Bob Fiden. And he was the guy that signed Patty Smith to Arista. Uh -huh. And uh, so he, he had like, he was like a, he was kind of a pioneer. He a really, yeah. He was just a really cool dude, you know, that had his ear to the ground, you know, and yeah. he, he had like legitimacy in his veins and he was, he knew kind of what was going on. And, uh, at that time, the head of RCA, the president of RCA, is this guy named Bob Buziak. And Bob Buziak had cut his teeth in Detroit when the, when the Stooges and MC5 were coming up. So he understood us intrinsically from the mm -hmm. get-go. Right. So those were the guys that courted us. Those were the guys that signed us. And by the time Swan Dive came out, I, unfortunately, I know the story, but um, go ahead. It's just, it's just, it's the yeah, typical story, so, but go ahead. Yeah, it is the typical story. So Bob Buziak was replaced, and uh, the guy that was in there was the head of RCA Country Division, and didn't know anything about us. They didn't really have, they just didn't, they didn't have the vision. Once the record came out, it was a different team than the team that signed us you yeah know, you're, really that's what happened you're kind of lucky the record even was even came out because a lot of those stories when a, when they change a band gets signed and you know they'll change hands and they, they'll just even they'll just shelf the record and the band will be forced to break up 
Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, they did. They 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 had invested a certain amount of money in us and a certain amount of time and you know whatever put us. They didn't really. By the time the record came out, they didn't really know what to do with us. Yeah. Honestly, I mean that's that's honestly. They didn't really know how to market it. They didn't know if they wanted to throw their money or weight behind us. You know. Did they give you so, any tour support to start? <clears throat> well. Uh, not none. None. Okay. Well, that's, that, <laughs> but, that you know that can be a good thing in a way. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't enough. I mean, the weird thing was we did a tour with uh, Prong and Coc, uh-huh. right? And so we 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 went all across the country with them. We did a tour with Soundgarden. Yeah. And and all these, it, it seems to me like in hindsight, and at the time we, we were we were a little disheartened with showing up to the venues and you know the posters that are on the wall right we both had these black and white posters that are kind of shitty and coc and prong have these full color posters and stuff like that we and, just didn't we didn't feel the support behind us although there was a little bit you know it wasn't, i mean they did put money up to put us on the on the road and it wasn't a lot uh i feel i feel like they didn't know what they i feel like they didn't they weren't fully invested, you know, so they were sort of like, I think if they had thrown, if they had waited, a, you know, it, I don't know. If they, It's weird that the bands that ended up being successful at that period of time were the ones that, uh, like, in particular, like Soundgarden is a great example. Not, not musically, but just like their label allowed them to develop over time. Right. And they invested in that band uh, their resources, right? So I think when it came to La Volta, that that RCA didn't really know how to apply their resources to what we were trying to do. They didn't get it, you know. Did, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. At, how long before the before RCA dropped the band? Well, we broke up. Oh, you, you broke know? up. Okay. Uh, yeah, we broke up and, because you were disillusioned but, but, from the record and all that. Well, no, there were a lot of there were there were a lot of factors about that. I I, I have to primarily take the hit for that because uh, I had a two year old son, oh. and um, so going on the road was really tough, just on my wife and on me to be away from him. Yeah, and uh, at the same time, you know, not getting the support from the label, uh, you know, any sort of minor conflicts that are going on in the band end up being. Uh, magnified in that particular situation and the way for us to make money was to stay on the road and to be on the road for six weeks away from my two-year-old son who at that point is cognizant of the fact that his dad's not there yeah um you know when i'm talking on the phone or whatever and um then and the it's hard. Six week tour is o- the six week tour is over, and all of a sudden you you have a proposal for another, you know, six week tour with only a week in between. It's like, you know, I had to make some decisions, and my decisions were to to stay with my family. And there was probably and not enough money to send home to the wife to pay the bills, right? That's exactly right. If it would have been a different story if I'd been able to support the family and I was out, but I wasn't. I wasn't able to do that. I wasn't making any money. And the only way to make money was to be on the road and then I'm away. And the only way we were making money anyway was, was selling tour merch, really. And it was like T-shirts and, and, and uh, posters and CDs or whatever. But uh, yeah. the label wasn't behind us. So it was a confluence of a lot of different factors. You know, there was a lot of stuff going on. It was like uh, there were strains within the band and there were, there were, there were the label not supporting us. And then there was the pull of my family at home that just made it. You know, it wasn't worth it, really. You know, it was what it ultimately came. To, that was my decision. Was it wasn't worth it to be away from my family to put myself out there like that? And um, I wasn't looking for. I think if the label had been more behind us, it might have changed the paradigm a little bit. I don't know. You think if uh, you guys wouldn't assign to a major label, maybe the band would have stayed together longer? I don't know. I mean, I think we, I think we lived our natural life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. That well, that gift album was that produced by a guy named Tom Hamilton? No, Tom Hamilton was the guy that did the first EP. Okay. And then uh, the, the gift was actually produced by um, 
a guy named Paul Coldery. And Paul Coldery went on to engineer some Radiohead stuff. Uh, so Tom Hamilton, even though he's from Boston, is not the same. Courtney Hall. Sorry. Well, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't uh, Tom Hamilton from there. Yes. <laughs> <From Aerosmith. laughs> because when I was a kid, that's how I, we were. I don't know how I got that, but we were all. Oh yeah, these guys were produced by the by the bass player from Aerosmith because <laughs> we just, just said Tom <laughs> Hamilton on it. We didn't know any. And the band kind of reminds me, uh, kind of like a cross between uh, Keith Morris era Black Flag and uh, and Aerosmith. So it was kind of you would. I don't know where I'm going All with right, that, but yeah, uh, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, are you living in Indianapolis now? You're back in Indianapolis? Oh no, no, no! I live. We live in Boston. Oh, you so. live in Boston? Okay. All right. Good. So you like Boston? So everything worked out great in Boston. What do oh, you? Oh yeah, do? Boston. Boston is home. I've got two sons. They're in bands as well. Huh? What, are, <laughs> what kind of bands are they in? They're in sort of like. Uh, pop punk emo kind of oh, band. Okay, that's cool. Did, had, did one did, is called uh, Blame It on Whitman, and the other one, uh, Whitman is a place in Massachusetts, so they practice there. So they call it Blame It on Whitman, and the other one is called Dance with Leland, which uh, Dance with Leland has both of my sons in it. Huh. Uh, one is the drummer, the other is the guitar player, and they both sing. What? And then Blaman and Whitman is my son plays guitar and sings in that band. What do they think? Have you, what do they think of your old band's music, Bullet La Volta music? I know you had another band, the Conks, but what do they think of Bullet La Volta? Um, uh, yeah, I think they, I think they like it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. They don't, they don't go on and on about it, but uh, I think, I, yeah, I think they appreciate it. You know. Didn't you guys do a reunion like uh, not too long ago? It was like some kind of. Well, uh, Boston thing, yeah, it wasn't exactly a reunion for Lavol. I mean, it sort of was. I mean, a little bit. So Ken Chambers was in town doing like a. Uh, he put a new version of the Moving Targets together, and they played uh, a show in Boston with a bunch of other Boston bands that were getting together to do a reunion, and um, so we put together a Lavolta set, and um, with a. Uh, with Ken and then uh, our original drummer, uh, Chris Guttmacher, who plays on the first EP and on The Gift, uh, came up and played a few songs with us uh, on that. And uh, my son Max played guitar on a couple of songs mm -hmm. as well. So it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Now, were you, the vocals on that Swan Dive album and on, on The Gift too, angry as hell. I mean, they were like yeah. extremely angry. Were you really pissed off or did you just, were you, uh, <laughs> you just thought it was like a punk rock thing to sound angry like that? Cause it well, sounded really, really. And, the, and particularly, uh, the song, uh, uh, before I fall, there's, there's like some angry stuff. And, uh, what's the song where you go? Um, Oh fuck. I can't think of the, maybe it's, um, uh, maybe drag. Uh, word get word, oh, but when bad news travels fast, what is that song? Uh, not to mention, oh my God! Yeah, that's drag. <laughs> yeah, really, really pissed off. Were you pissed off? Yeah, yeah sure. Good. I, yeah, I always have been. <laughs> good. I mean, are you still pissed off now? Yes, I am. Good, yeah. good. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. But, but you know, it it it, it takes different forms. Uh, I'm also happy. You know, it's oh. weird. It's a weird convolution. But, well, a lot of people who but, a lot of people. I'm sorry to interrupt. But a lot of people who who um, get their anger out by screaming on stage uh, tend to um, be more well adjusted. If you know what I mean, they they tend to get compared, their they get their compared thing. to what Com well they compared don't, to politicians well they don't hold <laughs> it to. they don't hold it in they they release their anger on stage by yelling and screaming and they don't hold it in and uh, go home and beat their yeah wives and stuff like that. I feel yeah I yeah I get you okay sure I yeah I mean I think that's kind of true it's like it was a really good way to release it for sure <laughs> um, you know I don't have that catharsis now because I don't really sing in a band like that but. You know, I don't know. At the time, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't really consider myself to be the same person that I was then. Yeah, we all you know, grow I've up. You know, changed a lot. Yeah, we all change and we all grow and whatever. And 
But I mean, at the same time, it's like, you know, I mean, I think if you listen to, if, particularly, I mean, your wife, I don't know. I mean, she, she sounds like she knows the lyrics of that album, but, you know, I mean, what you hear in that album is there's some, there's some pretty, uh, clear cut cries for help on that album. It's like, yeah, I think that, I think in general, right. I think so. I think in general, the way that my approach to, to music in particular, but life in general has to do with this sort of like music has, has always been my escape even when I when I was a, like a misunderstood teenager before I was ever in a band or anything, music has always been this sort of a world for me to escape into to sort of leave the present world that yeah. I'm in and sort of go into this sort of place where regular rules don't apply, regular life doesn't apply. It's an escape for me, right? It's like this world that's created by and for reckless abandon and just sort of like it's, it's a place for pure expression and 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 anger and vitality and all those things to sort of exist in that space right and those kind of things are not condoned in your regular life right uh, at, at work or whatever so you have this sort of escape hatch, an outlet. Right? And, it's an outlet and, yeah and and music was always that for me so if you listen to Swan Dive in particular or the gifts or Bubba La Volta in general, whatever it is, I think it's pretty clear that I was, I was trying to remove myself from the quote unquote regular fucking world, you know? Yeah. Because that doesn't really hold my reality. My reality exists outside of, of the reality that most people consider to be normal. You know, my reality has to exist outside of that and uh, for me to function as a human being. And that just means that, that doesn't mean that I don't address reality on the ground. That just means that I have a different way of being able to vent those feelings and, the, and, and, and those frustrations and that anger. And I have a place to put it where it's acceptable, not just acceptable, but uh, expected, right? In that song, uh, "Ceiling Life," it there, it, break, it breaks <laughs> yeah. it breaks down into a real like you know, almost mellow and, and uh, melodic, pretty part. You know, and you, um, you the the breakdown part, and you say uh, she was a brown skinned woman. She had dark wavy hair. She had black wavy hair. Yeah. Was that your wife? No, actually. I took that line from a Lead Belly song. Ah, oh, okay. All right. Um, so at the time that LaVolta was on the road, we used to listen to this Lead Belly tape over and over oh. again. <clears throat> and uh, there's a Lead Belly song where she, you know, she was a brown skinned woman. She had black wavy hair. And um, it, it, I, I, I think that with Feeling Life, Feeling Life, the 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 actual verse part before it goes into the breakdown part, the verse part is a uh, <laughs> an exposition of the ideal of the sort of like a I base it on the idea of like Woodstock or like a hippie festival, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you're at this festival. It's basically feeling life is sort of, is sort of like means living your life upside down and everything is flipped over. Right. So uh-huh. it's a concept and that feeling life means that your feet are not on the floor. Your feet are on the ceiling. Right. And you're upside down and you're hanging and everybody else in the world is, is on the ground and, and you're, you're living above them. Right. So feeling life means, you're living above everybody and you're sort of looking down at everything happening, sort of like a, like a trip or an LSD experience or an, a psychic experience or a mind expanding experience that it's, it's a, it's a total train of thought song. The way that I wrote that song is so funny because I just wrote down the sort of like the most ridiculous ideas of 
in mind that that somebody's at, at like a rock festival in a tent living mm-hmm. in a tent and uh and then at the end of it, when it breaks down, it's sort of like these idealized concepts of 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 uh, everything. You're living upside down, and all of a sudden you're in that world, right? So when it flips over, you, that's your ceiling life, and you you're going in like, you know, I, she was a brown skinned woman, and it's like she's drifting away, and you're like trying to hang on to something, and you know she had black wavy hair. It's like these sort of like concepts of the of, of just an ideal of something, right? And- but it has to be, it's not a specific thing. It's a thought. It's a feeling. It's a, it's a, it's intangible. And it's, you know, it's something that you're trying to hold on to that, uh, doesn't exist and, or the, something. and the chorus don't take me from the sea land that means you want to yeah uh, you want to you want to stay there right yeah, yeah. you want to be you want to live in that world you want to escape forever you don't want to you don't want to come back down right so uh, you know it's funny like there's one line of that song where, where i say uh purple straw shot from the south uh i mean i don't know if you know the lyrics to that song because they're not I, I, but uh it's I, all very convoluted but there's one thing where i say purple straw shot from the south your wife would probably get a kick out of this if she knows the lyrics uh because the purple straw shot from the south is just a fart oh <laughs> okay how how is a purple straw <laughs> shot from the south is that a is that a boston lingo for a fart no i just made it up oh okay <laughs> the lyrics on this out on that album are really uh, well thought out and uh you know i was talking about uh, the drag uh What's the problem? Oh my God! And then when you say, "I'm awfully glad you asked," it, it, that uh, sets the song completely where it should be. You know, what's the problem? Oh my God! And then you say, "I'm awfully glad you asked." And then you know, it's really fucking angry as hell and really cathartic for me to listen to. <laughs> well, well, whatever you get from that, yeah. you know, it's good. Uh, are you are you happy with all those Bolt LaVolta records? Am I happy with them? I mean, them? do you do you like all three of those things? The Matador was pretty much a um, was pretty much a compilation, right? What's that? When the the last record that was on Matador, that was pretty much a compilation, right? Didn't Matador Records put out a Bolt LaVolta? No, that wasn't a compilation. No, that was a live set that we played oh, on the radio it was live, live, when we were first starting out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was good because I, I thought that came out after Swan Dive. Well, it, it came out on Matador after Swan Dive, yeah, but it was yeah. recorded in eighty oh, seven. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. And the sense. band was pretty pretty early. So, so yeah. you, I'm, I don't even know what my question is. Anything you would have done different about those records? But you asked me if I'm happy with them. Yeah, I mean, and, you're, are you I pleased really, with are you pleased with the way they uh, came out? Well, here's the thing, right? It's like you always look at things and say, like, I would have could I have done I, I would have done this different. I might have done that, but I don't. I sort of don't. I I kind of don't go in for the whole like what if kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I would say one. You know, I mean, there's certain things that bother me about certain things. You know, particularly on Swan Dive. I mean. We sort of allowed the. I hesitate to say it because I think that when you when I say something that that bothers me that might not bother somebody else. Right, but yeah, once I say yeah. that, then they're going to recognize it. and They're going to carry that with them every time they hear it. They're going to go, "I never thought of that, but now that I hear it, fuck." You know. So I hesitate to say it, but I mean, there's little things that sort of that bother me about it. But in general, I will say, you know, it is what it is. It happened when it happened, and it represents that thing that was going on with the band at the time they're all sort of like they're all sort of documents of of that time and place you know so in that respect yeah i'm 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 fine with it you know it is what it is i cringe sometimes when i hear some of the fucking lyrics that i wrote you know honestly it's like like i said before i don't feel like the same person that wrote those things you know so some of it comes off a little you know, it sounds clunky. It sounds a little stupid sometimes, but whatever. It's you know, I mean, I was a kid sometimes when I wrote that that stuff. You know, I so guess, whatever. I guess the que- that what it, well, I should have phrased it was, are you proud of those of all those records? Well, yeah, to some, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, I am. Um, yeah, I'm proud of them. They're. 
I think they hold up, you know, in general, like listening and rocking out. It's like fucking crank it up really loud and you feel a certain way. Yeah, they generate they generate what we were intending and, and when when is the last time fucking, when's the it last It was a kick ass band. I mean, I'll just say that. You know, it was we were a fucking kick ass band. It, it was, it really when was. When we played, we we were we were out there to fucking destroy. We were out there to make yeah, we were out there to destroy, but we we're also there to try to make sure that we're not wasting our time. We want to take everybody with us on whatever trip we're fucking going on, right? You know, that's what I'm saying. You know, yeah. you want to, you want everybody to be there with you when you're going wherever you're going and whatever you're doing. So, you I want th- people to get swept up in that thing. And those songs were pretty fucking kick ass. Some yeah. of those songs. Yeah. And and for 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 what was I guess called punk rock at the time, extremely catchy tunes. I mean, there's so many sing-alongs, even especially even on the gift, dead wrong, police gift, uh, and um, between the lines, super catchy as hell. And is like I can go on you know, on kissing your ass about every song, but uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad you like it. Really, you know, I mean, it's it's nice. It's it's nice to have people when, that appreciate it. I when like is, that. When's the last time you listened to a Bolt Lavalta song? Oh, um, I hesitate because uh, I, it hasn't been that long, but I don't remember okay. when. It's been a while. Um, yeah, within the last year, you know, so at some point. Oh, okay. Are you still playing now? No. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yes and no. I have some friends that I get together with, and we hang out and play music like once every few months, but since this fucking COVID pandemic has been going on, we haven't been getting together. So, but no, I'm not really playing in a band per se. What do you, what do you do for a living? Uh, right now I'm not doing anything. I'm, I was looking for a job before the pandemic hit and, uh, uh, have an Airbnb at my house. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, that's good. We're trying to get our house Airbnb ready, too. What does your wife do? Yeah, we, we had... We've had... Uh, well, yeah, the Airbnb, we did it for about a year solid before all the shit hit. And it was going pretty good. So... <clears throat> yeah, like uh, the, the, that puts a real damper in an Airbnb when you can't rent the damn thing out, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're still, then, yeah, you're still married to the same girl that you were with when you were in when you moved from Indianapolis. Yes. Oh, how long? My you wife and I, we've been together for thirty four, thirty four years. Yeah, now. I am. I just celebrated my thirtieth anniversary. Thirty five, thirty five years. Long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have two two grown sons and. Um, yeah, I don't know. She's still my. She and I are both still totally solid. That's good. How old are you? I am fifty nine. Fifty. Oh, you're about almost about one one year older than me. Well, Kurt. Anybody? Did they ever call you y- y- yucky? Did your kids ever call you yucky? No. <laughs> did they know <laughs> you? Were, did they make fun of they you? Just call me dad. <laughs> did they ever make fun of you for the name Yucky Guy? Oh no! Okay. No, of course not. They know better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. They, when you name yourself Yucky Guy, if you know it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, what are you gonna say to me? <laughs> yeah. What are you gonna say? Oh, hey. <laughs> it's not. I mean, it, you know, it's like if you know the Conks at all, too. It's like, I mean, that's that's that was my musical identity. The Conks were together for twelve years. It's like. You know, everything is built to fucking be disastrous. <laughs> I don't even care. Yeah. Your other band, The Conks, you did a cover of an Aerosmith tune. You did Let the Music Do Talking, right? Yeah, we did the Joe Perry uh, the no. Joe Perry Project no, version. No, <laughs> you did. No, you did Steven Tyler's version on vocals. You did the Steven think... Tyler vocal version. Oh, really? I think we did the Joe Perry uh, version. What were I the lyrics? We... Check me, baby, if you want to dance. Grab yourself a partner and take a chance. Is that the one you sang? Ah, 
fuck, I don't remember, man. Yeah, that was the Aerosmith. I'm, well, I'm gonna have to go back. And, I'm gonna have to go back and compare. Pretty sure it's the Aerosmith version, but uh, pretty sure it's Steven Tyler's vocal melody. But anyway, it's a great version, and uh, it's it's a coincidence because I have a there's a a group of listeners to this show that's a Facebook group, and um, somebody posted, "Hey, does anybody know?" This is like a week ago. Somebody, does anybody know of anybody who's covered this? Anybody else who's covered uh, Let the Music Do a Talk? And, he, and all this guy put up was Joe Perry Project and the Aerosmith version. And I said, Oh, funny you should say, there, here's a version right here. And this guy was in a great band called Bullet LaVolta. And, and yeah, I think it's Steven Tyler's version, but it doesn't. I don't even know what I asked you, but anyway, it's a great version. It's a great tune and a great version. You, so you're an Aerosmith. I guess Air, everybody in, Air, in Boston was an Aerosmith fan, right? Well, you know, I, I was I was an Aerosmith fan before, well before I ever moved to Boston. Yeah, yeah. I saw Aerosmith in 1976. Uh, so did I. And, on, on the Rocks and tour. And 77, yeah. And they were in such bad fucking shape, yeah. they couldn't even play. Yeah, yeah. Joe Perry was falling into his amps, and he had, he had roadies uh -huh, behind his yeah. amp just to fucking hold his amp up. Yeah, I saw yeah, But then I, I saw them again in, in the... I saw them again in like uh, either the early 2000s or the late 90s. No, it was, in, it was the early 2000s, and they were fucking great. <laughs> Yeah, I saw him on the Rocks tour in like 76, 75, 70, I don't remember, I think 76. And then I saw him on the Draw the, I saw him a million times, but back when they were doing the Cal Jam days, and that's when they were really fucked up, they were in Draw the Line. And I remember Joe Perry just, uh, they got up and played with Ted Nugent. You know, they did a, like an encore with Ted Nugent, and Joe Perry was so fucked up, he, could, he picked up his guitar, and then he played for like one second, and then put it down and walked off the stage. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they were a mess, man. That's when I tried to tell people, they're like, Aerosmith must have been great. And I was like, man, I got to tell you, I saw hundreds of rock shows and those guys were fucking shit. Yeah, but somebody for, for a band that was so fucked up, they made some good records back then. Yeah, they sure did. That's, a, <laughs> that's true. All right, well, Kirk, I really thank you for doing this. It was really nice to talk to you, and I'm glad I got to uh, find out what's going on with you now. <laughs> You were kind yeah, of no problem, you were kind of always Thanks a, for reaching out. You were kind of a mystery uh to me and uh I always wonder, wonder where this guy is and so I'm glad I got to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, it turns out it's not such a mystery after uh, all. Well, still it's a good I think it's a I always like to hear the story and uh I think it's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for uh, thanks for reaching out. I appreciate I appreciate it, All right. and I'm glad you think it's. I had to actually look up the uh, the definition of masterpiece after you wrote that to me because I'm like <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, uh, well, I think I think it's a great record. My wife loves it even twice as much as I do. So, and you know, if if my wife likes a record like that, it must have something because she's not usually into that kind of music. She's mus she's more into you know. I won't get into that, but but she loves. <laughs> she's singing along to all. We were listening to it coming back from the mushroom hunt, and she was singing along to every line. So wow. that's that's saying something. If my wife likes it, it's saying something. Oh, well, that's cool. That's the way I feel about my wife too. So uh, yeah, well, tell her I said thanks, and I tell her I tell her I hope that you know. I hope it served her well all these years. All right, Kurt. Well, thank you for doing this. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your night, and be safe out there, friend. Okay, man. All well, right. take care. All Thanks. Right. Talk to you Bye. later. Bye. All right. There you go. <clears throat> Kurt Davis, a.k.a. Yucky Guy. I hope that was okay. I'm a, I'm such a fan of Swan Dive. On a, Either the episode before... I'm, I'm going to post this one tonight. And uh, after this one, I'm going to be doing... I'm going to do a track-by-track track of Swan Dive from top to bottom. Uh is a great fucking album. So I'm going to close out with the song we were talking about called Ceiling Life from the Swan Dive record. Six minutes and 58 seconds. But man, it's six minutes and 58 seconds of pure joy for me, friends. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. As I always say, it's a value for value. So if you got any value out of this, uh, I ask you, please contribute what value it gave you i would tell you to go to um kurt davis's <laughs> website 
and let him know you heard him on the Rock and Roll Geek Show. But you can't get in touch with this guy. I think he's on Instagram. I will post his Instagram link, and you can send him a message and let him know you heard him on the Rock and Roll Geek Show so he doesn't think he wasted 54 minutes and 33 seconds of his time. All right, friends. I will talk to you soon. Find the show at rockandrollgeek.com. Send me an email, rockandrollgeek at gmail.com. Here's Sealing Life. I will talk to you uh, probably in a couple of days. We'll do a uh, regular Rock and Roll Geek show, and we'll break down Swan Dive, the masterpiece that is Swan Dive. I'll talk to you later, friends.
It's a rock and roll geek train wreck. <laughs> 